coming up, an amateur archaeologist stumbles on something extraordinary. Nothing like it has ever been found in India. It's almost like some sort of Egyptian sarcophagus. Did he find the tomb of the real Buddha? You've been staring at this for a long time. Is this a fake? The answer will mean the world to Buddhists everywhere. Everyone knows of Bodh Gaya, but whoever has heard of Piprava? And yet it could be hugely significant within the world of Buddhism. Bones of the Buddha on Secrets of the Dead. On a spectacular journey through northern India, renowned historian Charles Allen follows in the footsteps of a real man of flesh and blood, the historical Buddha, and uncovers a real life Indiana Jones tale of buried treasure. In 1898, a colonial landowner made an extraordinary archaeological find, perhaps thousands of years old, perhaps even the tomb of the Buddha himself. Imagine finding the bones of Christ. But the find has been dogged by rumors of forgery ever since. You've been staring at this for a long time. Is this a fake? This film aims to resolve a series of mysteries. Is this little-known monument in northern India really the Buddha's tomb? Is the find genuine? And if it is, who created it and when? For the nearly 400 million Buddhists worldwide, the stakes could not be higher. This is Bodh Gaya in northern India, Buddhism's holiest site. Here, more than 2,400 years ago, a former prince, Sakyamuni Gautama, found enlightenment and became the Awakened One, the Buddha. Bodh Gaya is home to scores of Buddhist memorial mounds, known as stupas. Could the Piprawa stupa, 200 miles away, be the holiest of them all? To answer that question, historian Charles Allen begins his quest, not in India, but on a quiet suburban street in England home to the treasure that he first saw several years ago, launching his fascination with this extraordinary, unresolved mystery. Neil. Hello. Like Charles Allen, Neil Pepe was raised in British India and is the grandson of W.C. Pepe, the man who made the remarkable discovery at Piprawa, a site on his colonial estate. That is patently William Claxton Pepper, your grandfather, is it not? Yes, it's his old chest. There's some sort of the photos. And there he is. The, that is the Piprawa stupa. This is the excavation site? This, yes, and you can see the trench that was cut through the middle of it. 
Beneath the Piprawa stupa, Willy Pepe found a huge stone sarcophagus over 20 feet down. In it were some reliquary urns and more than a thousand separate jewels, carved semi-precious stones, and gold and silver objects of incalculable value. A fraction of the jewels, duplicates, were given to Pepe more than a hundred years ago and preserved here by the family. Well, I have to say, Neil, this is really what I've come here to see, which is the Piprawa treasure. Well, these ones were the original frames done by my grandfather. What strikes me is how absolutely fabulous they are. The exquisite workmanship that's, that's displayed here. Look at all these beautiful jewels. And the other thing is, these must be thousands of years old. Yes, I think they are. But the awful thing is, we don't quite know how old or why there's such an extraordinary collection. Yes. It's... And I suppose that is really what I've got to find out. Well, I very much hope you do. A cloud still hangs over this amazing find, one that has deterred serious scholarship and blackened the name of Willy Pepe. And Neil, here we are, more than a century after your grandfather's famous discovery, and there are still talk of hoaxes and conspiracy theories. How, what do you make of that? I, f I find it quite extraordinary. I really, I don't understand it. It seems quite illogical. As far as my family is concerned, the man was incapable of forging anything. Neil grew up on his grandfather's estate, Birdpur, in northern India, where Willy Pepe made his remarkable discovery. And here's Birdpur House itself, the home the family left more than 50 years ago. Four thousand miles away, Birdpoor House still stands. Here, Charles Allen begins his search for answers to the Piprawa mystery. Yes, it's faded. It's not looking at its best, but it is the same house. Three generations of the Pepe's grew up in this house, and Neil, who's now in his 70s, he must have played on these lawns. He must have played along the veranda up there. The house was first built by the Pepe family when they arrived in India in the 1840s, during the early days of Britain's Indian Empire. The family created a vast 30,000-acre estate here, growing crops like sugarcane and rice. The question is, did the man who lived here in the 1890s really discover the remains of the Buddha? Or was he the victim of a hoax? Or even the hoaxer himself. Willie Pepe, a state manager and engineer, was in his mid-40s when he turned amateur archaeologist in 1897. The landscape of this part of northern India is low and flat. But at the northern edge of the Birdpur estate is a mysterious mound. 
known as Piprawa. It was here that Pepe set his men digging. I don't think we'll ever know exactly what motivated William Pepe, but the fact is this was the golden age of Indian archaeology. All sorts of exciting discoveries were being made at this time, in particular, the discovery of some lost Buddhist sites, one of them very near here. After weeks of clearing away soil at the mound, Pepe's men had exposed the top of a large brick structure. But what lay beneath? This is the Piprawa stupa as it is today, beautifully restored. But this is not what it would have been like in 1898. You have to imagine that I would now be standing deep underground because the surface level of the ground would have come about 20 feet above my head. So the first thing Mr. Pepe has to do is to expose the top of this vast mound and his workmen uncover a lovely brick dome. So in January 1898, the first thing they do is run a great trench right the way through the monument. And then they dig down deep into the ground. When finally they've got to the bottom, and what do they find? A neat little alcove, and inside it, this vast stone coffer. And nothing like it has ever been found in India. It's almost like some sort of Egyptian sarcophagus. Will they find a body? Will they find treasure? You can imagine the excitement building. It must have been an extraordinary moment. On the morning of January 18th, 1898, Pepe and his men went down into the shaft. This was the moment they had been waiting for. The huge lid, weighing nearly a quarter of a ton, was slid aside. And for the first time, Pepe was able to look inside. He waved his workers back to give himself room and began to remove what he found. We know from family accounts that William Pepe reached down into the box and produced a water pot. I suspect a great sense of anticlimax. He was an ordinary little water pot, as you might find in India today. So he would have handed that to his foreman, looked down again. And this time he comes up with a rather beautiful stoneware object, a jar of some sort with a, with a top. Okay, a bit more excitement, perhaps. Hands it to his foreman. The next pot seemed unremarkable, too. A low stone jar with a lid. This, too, was carefully wrapped in newspaper. But something much more remarkable was to come. Now, it's almost as if William Pepe has saved the best for the last, because the fifth time his hand comes out of the box, he is holding a beautiful, shining crystal object. It has a beautiful lid on top in the shape of a fish. And when he lifts the lid off, you can imagine a gasp of astonishment, because it glittered with jewels. And hundreds of little flowers made of precious stones. A most thrilling sight it must have been. 
And there's more to come, because when they actually looked inside the stone coffer, they saw the entire floor was covered with glittering items, gold and little precious and semi-precious jewels. I mean, there were over 1,600 individual items there. A unique offering of some sort had been laid across the floor of this great coffer. A complete mystery. But what an amazing moment for the Pepe family. The discovery was unlike anything found in India before or since. Now, we also know from the family's own account that one of William Pepe's nieces was there, and she said to her uncle, Oh, Uncle Willie, do dig deeper. And he said, No, that's the end of it, which, with hindsight, was a terrible mistake. Digging deeper might have answered questions that clouded this amazing find for the next hundred years. But Pepe did not dig deeper. And why should he? What he had already found was little short of miraculous. Willie was an estate manager, not an archaeologist. Little attention was paid to the details of which jewels had come from which of the jars. More importantly, what everyone had overlooked in all the excitement were the bits of bone and ash mixed in with the jewels. Well, that same evening, Pepe realized that these fragments must be human remains. As to who they were or how old they might be, of course, he had no idea. But he was very careful. He, he gathered them all up, and he, he, he put them inside two stone jars, which he sealed. And then he sat down to write two crucial letters. Well, the first of the two letters went to a friend of his, Vincent Smith. He was a local district officer based in Gorakhpur, about 50 miles to the south. And he was also a very keen antiquarian, indeed quite a specialist. The second letter, however, was to a genuine archaeologist, the only archaeologist in the entire area. And he was actually working about 20 miles to the north on an excavation. And his name was Dr. Anton Führer. Both these men wrote back almost immediately, and they were both very excited by what he discovered. And they both asked exactly the same question. Is there an inscription anywhere? Pepe, in fact, had already found one. Around the neck of one of the reliquary jars was a line of spidery writing, consisting of 36 strange letters. The letters themselves, let alone the language they represented, were completely unknown and indecipherable to Pepe. But he painstakingly copied out the mysterious inscription and scribbled a hasty note to his friend, Vincent Smith, the local district officer. Now, quite amazingly, this little scrap of paper has survived. You can see that Willie Pepe has very carefully copied the characters on the urn. And then underneath it, you can see that Vincent Smith has given his first transcription of what it might mean. Ya Salila Nidani Buddhasa. And then if you turn this little scrap of paper over, on the back, you find Vincent Smith's reply, and it begins, the relics appear to be those of the Buddha himself. Hard to imagine what must have been going through Pepe's mind when he saw that. This is mind-blowing stuff. Mind-blowing indeed. No relics of the Buddha, dead for almost two and a half thousand years, 
had ever been found. If Pepe had located them, it was a discovery of huge importance, akin to finding a piece of the true cross. Führer's response was just as enthusiastic. He wrote back, your shrine contains real relics of Lord Buddha. Within weeks, Dr. Führer, in his role as official archaeologist for much of northern India, was on his way to see Pepe, a visit that would have dire consequences. No one knew it yet, but Dr. Führer was a fraud. The enigmatic Dr. Anton Führer. Roman Catholic priest turned reverend, turned amateur curator, turned bogus Sanskritist, turned professional archaeologist. I spent years trying to understand this man and years trying to find a photograph. And the best I've been able to come up with, there's one that shows him at the scene of one of his early digs, and you can see him standing by a statue. And the other one, here he is at Piprawa, and he's standing with William Pepe. But in both those pictures, he's a kind of shadowy figure. And really, that's the shadow that he casts over the Piprawa Stupa excavation. An unsuspecting Pepe met Dr. Fuhrer at Piprawa four weeks or so after the find. Soon, a scandal would surround Führer. The German archaeologist had sold bogus Buddha relics, falsified numerous reports, and worst of all, had faked at least one ancient inscription. He resigned before he could be fired. In its capital in Calcutta, India's British government faced its own scandal. Dr. Fuhrer, after all, was one of their most senior archaeologists. The reaction of the government was one of embarrassment. Uh, what on earth are we going to do? And the first thing they did was to try and destroy all his records. They were patently bogus. The best thing to do was just simply wipe them out. Then they had the problem of Piprawa. Now, here had been discovered not only some rather wonderful jewels, but also some actual bones and ashes. And I think the immediate response was, let's get them out of the country as fast as we can. The government saw an opportunity to kill two birds with one stone. They'd long wanted to ingratiate themselves with the neighboring state, Siam. So they formally presented the Piprawa ashes and bones to Siam's Buddhist king, Rama V, scoring a diplomatic victory and brushing the affair under the carpet before the Fura scandal could boil over. But where did that leave Pepe and his extraordinary find? The suspicion had to be that Dr. Führer had interfered in some way with the Piprawa excavation. He had the opportunity, perhaps, to go into the excavation itself, go into the coffer, perhaps even put some items in there, or even conspired with Mr. Pepe, perhaps even conspired with the other officials, some gigantic hoax. But the key conspiracy theory involves the Piprawa inscription. The basis of that theory is that Dr. Führer had the opportunity and the expertise to fake it himself. Over a century later, that conspiracy theory has never been entirely disproved.
the crucial piece of evidence is here in Calcutta. Stored in the city's museum, the original inscribed Piprawa urn. Stone cannot be carbon dated, nor can the inscription. But for the right expert, there are vital clues in the text itself. Now, I'm hoping that waiting for me at the museum will be Professor Harry Falk. Now, he is the world's leading authority on ancient Indian languages. We've corresponded, but I've never met him. So I have no idea what's going to happen. Harry Falk is a professor at Germany's oldest institute of Indology in Berlin. Harry. This must be you. Must be Harry. He's been studying ancient Indian languages for more than 40 years. What will his verdict be on the possible involvement of fellow German Anton Führer? What strikes me is how clear the writing is, how each character has been clearly defined. So, Harry, you've been staring at this for a long time. Is this a fake? I can definitely say this is not a fake. How can you say that? First, the script is absolutely authentic. Uh, the object is authentic. The language is the language of that time in that area of India. Now, the obvious perpetrator is Dr. Fear. Now, surely he could have done this. Uh, yes, he was employed as an archaeologist, uh, but his uh, knowledge of Sanskrit was deficient. The text uses a vocabulary like uh, Nidhani, which is not found at any other place. Harry, that unusual word you use there, what's the significance of that? The term is Nidhani, and it means container in a neutral sense. It's only found on this casket, no, no other place. So in other words, it'd be very unusual for Führer to have picked on this very obscure word. Uh, yes, since Führer was a uh, not-so-skilled Sanskritist, to say it mildly, um, he would have uh, copied terms from other reliquaries and uh, not coined the term on his own. Everything surpasses the capacities of Dr. Führer immensely. So it is a genuine and unique inscription? Absolutely, yes. Sukiti Bhati Nam Sabhagini Kanam Saputta Dalanang Yang Salila Nidhani Buddha Sabhagava Sa Sakiya and then he he ran out of space and he added two letters yes, on top of it uh, Sayanam. Now for for me, Harry, what does that say? This reliquary, which is the reliquary of the Buddha, the lord of the Shakya clan in, uh, in the Terai. So, Harry, you're absolutely confident that this reliquary contained the remains of the Buddha? Yes, we can be absolutely confident because the text says uh, Buddha Salile Bhagavate. That means these are the relics of the Buddha, the Lord. So the world expert is convinced that the vital inscription is genuine, clearing the name of Willy Pepe. But now a deeper mystery emerges. According to Harry Falk, 
the script used for the inscription didn't exist when the Buddha died. And the only comparable urns are from long afterwards, too. So, Harry, you are confident that this urn contained the remains of the Buddha, but it does not date from the time of the Buddha. It dates from about a century and a half, perhaps, after the Buddha. Would you agree with that? This is absolutely correct, yes. So how can it be that an urn that claims to have contained the remains of the Buddha was made at least 150 years after he died? The answer to that question lies back in time, around 2,300 years before Pepe made his find, at the time of the Buddha himself. How did an ordinary man of flesh and blood start a world religion? How and where did he die? And how might his remains have ended up in the tomb Pepe found? some delightful paintings of the Buddha, the life of the Buddha, which you see depicted in Janak Puri folk art. And when you look at images like this, it's very hard to remember that this is a real person. But the fact is, the Buddha was a real person of flesh and blood. In fact, we know as much about him as we know about Jesus Christ or indeed the prophet Muhammad. He lived in, in the Gangetic Plains in the 5th century BCE. He was probably born about 500, and he probably died about 410 BCE. The Buddha was born in Lumbini, not far from Piprawa. He was raised a royal prince, but in his early 30s, he fled the luxury of the palace and witnessed human suffering, old age, illness, and death for the first time. When he saw an old hermit at prayer, he rejected his former life and became a hermit himself. For six years, he led a life of extreme denial, earning himself a new name, Sakyamuni, holy man of his own clan, the Sakyas. Then he came to the place that would bring him to enlightenment, Bodhgaya. When Buddha first came here, it was nothing but trees and jungle. But over the centuries, Bodhgaya has grown into a great holy site, as sacred as Mecca or Jerusalem. humbling to think that this, for millions and millions of Buddhists, this is the center of their universe. And that there are people here uh, from Tibet, from China, from Burma, from Thailand, from Sri Lanka, and indeed of foreigners from the West as well. And there's a very real sense of spirituality here, which I find very, very moving. This is the epicenter of the Buddhist faith. And of course, everyone knows of Port Gaya, but whoever has heard of Piprawa, and yet it could be hugely significant within the world of Buddhism.
At the heart of this holy site is the Bodhi tree. Meditating here, Buddha finally understood the causes of human suffering and attained enlightenment. And so, a new religion was born. Buddhism. In his footsteps, the pilgrims still walk. Two and a half thousand years later. Here at Bodhgaya, the Buddha transcended time entering an eternal present without future or past. For Bhante Pyapala Chakma, a descendant of the Buddha's Sakya clan, it is this eternal present that gives Buddha his power. When he was born in Lumbini, he was born just ordinary person who sometimes used to live in the past or in the future, not in the present. But after he became enlightened in the Bodhi tree, then he started living exactly at the present moment. But the thing is that the uh, you know, differences between an ordinary person and the person of enlightenment, like a Buddha, that's Buddha lives always at the present moment. Don't live in the past, don't live in the future. But on the other hand, an ordinary person lives either in the past or in the future, not in the present. At around the age of 80, Buddha set out on his final journey back to his homeland close to Piprawa. His route was marked, later, by memorial stupas and stone columns, where he delivered his last sermon, where he turned back the crowds and continued with just his close disciples. Sixty miles short of Lumbini, at Kushinagar, he lay down between two trees that suddenly flowered out of season and he died. This huge statue at Kushinagar marks the spot where he experienced what Buddhists call the final extinguishing. But it's what happened after his death that provides the vital clues to locate Buddha's true burial place. As soon as the Buddha had died, his body was cremated. Now, over the years, he'd gathered a, a very large following. So there was an almighty squabble because everybody wanted a share of his remains. And this could only be resolved when it was decided that the remains should be divided into eight portions, which would go to eight kings, including the Sakya family, the members of his own Sakya clan. The inscription states that the Piprawa urn contained this precious Sakya family portion. Since Piprawa is at the heart of Sakya territory, Buddha's homeland, was it possible that Pepe had found this original burial site of Buddha's remains? The only one of the eight portions to be found.
perhaps. But that original burial would have been simple. The bones and ashes laid in the ground with flowers, buried under a mound of earth, nothing like the tomb that Pepe had discovered. So even if the fragments of bone and ash belonged to the Buddha, the elaborate tomb must have been created later by someone else. So who could have built it? And when? And why? There's one place that could hold the answers to these vital questions. A remarkable site at the very heart of India. Sanchi, 450 miles away. There it is. Very striking. We're sweeping into Sanchi Hill, and there it rises out of the plain. And right on the top is the great stupa with its magnificent carvings, one of the wonders of the world. With its huge stupa, 50 feet high, Sanchi is a monument to the spread of Buddhism. Could it be that the man who first built this site was also responsible for the spectacular tomb that Pepe found? The carving here is monumental. It's a miracle, you might say, that it survived 2,000 years plus. And yeah, here it is, and it's the only one like it. It's breathtaking. The monument was begun by a great emperor who converted his Indian empire to Buddhism 150 years after the Buddha died. His name was Ashoka, and his conversion marked a dramatic personal transformation. It's impossible not to be moved by the character of Ashoka. Here is an extremely violent, unpleasant, ruthless emperor who seizes the throne by violence, kills all his brothers, and then suffers some extraordinary change of heart and is suddenly converted completely becomes a new man. And from that moment onwards, Asia has a ruler who actually rules by principles of morality. He is the one who changes this minor cult into what is initially a national religion and then a world religion. <laughs> Three crucial facts suggest possible connections between Ashoka and Piprawa. Sanchi shows how Ashoka built hundreds of brick stupas all over India. How he dug up the original portions of Buddha's remains and redistributed them to these new sites. Was Piprawa among them? A clue may be found in one of India's earliest languages. Ashoka used a form of Sanskrit to create written edicts. First on rocks, and later on a series of huge sandstone pillars. They were written in script called Brahmi.
the very script used to make the Piprawa inscription. That inscription, according to Harry Falk, was made around 150 years after Buddha died, exactly when Ashoka reigned. But if Ashoka did create the tomb at Piprawa, if it did mark the burial site of Buddha's own family, the Sakya clan, it would have been one of Buddhism's holiest sites. How could such a place possibly have been forgotten? The answer to that question lies in what happened to Buddhism after Ashoka died. Ashoka wanted to transform his kingdom into a Buddhist country. And in a sense, that was a step too far. These statues did not lose their heads by accident. Buddhism challenged the authority of India's Hindu priests, who saw it as a heresy to be suppressed. And what the Hindu priests started, Muslim invaders completed. Over the centuries, Ashoka, the Brahmi script, and Indian Buddhism itself were all erased from memory, almost as if they had never been. It wasn't until the 1800s that Buddhism was all rediscovered, mainly by British scholars. Brahmi was deciphered. Ashoka was identified. So were places like the Sanchi Monument. And Paprawa, among the last sites to be found, was unearthed by Willy Pepe in 1898. All the evidence seems to point toward Ashoka as the man who created this remarkable tomb. For world expert Harry Falk, the huge sarcophagus is the clincher. So this is 132, little less. The dimensions of the chest seem to fit the typical measurements of a Shokan artwork. The looks, the feel, everything uh, smacks of a Shokan perfectionism. Harry Falk is convinced that the sarcophagus is made of sandstone from the same quarry Ashoka used for his pillars. And that it may even have been made at the same time as the nearby pillar at Lumbini. So does that mean it's possible to give this stone chest a date? This should have been done when Ashoka was in Lumbini and in, in that area. That means around his 20th regnal year, which comes down to 245 uh, BC, roughly. You give me a very specific date, Harry. Highly unusual. Such a precise date is a breakthrough, but vital questions remain. Why did Ashoka choose Piprawa? Was it the original burial place of Buddha's remains by his own Sakya family? If Pepe had dug deeper, as his niece suggested in 1898, he might have found the answer. But many years later, someone else did. It was 1971. The excavator this time was not a British colonial, but a young Indian archaeologist, K.S. Srivastava. 
His daughter, Merdula, recalls how it all began. Actually, when my father started excavation in 1971, we just asked him, with what intentions you are doing this? He said that, uh, uh, I want to do something which no one has done, something which will stand in my name. Srivastava was convinced that the chamber where Pepe had found the sarcophagus wasn't at ground level and that there might be something beneath it. Pepe's excavation had long since been filled in. So Srivastava had to go down through the whole stupa again from the top. Every month, and when he used to come back to the headquarters, my brother, myself, and my sister, we used to just keep waiting for, at the door for him. As soon as he started climbing the stairs, we said, Papa, did you get anything? Every time when he used to say, that, no, not this time, not this time, we could see the tension and worry on my father's face. But ultimately, in 72, when he got the relic caskets, and he came to Patna and we asked, Papa, did you get something? He said, oh, yes, I have done it. And he had. Just below Pepe's find, he located an earlier burial. Two small chambers each with a soapstone casket and some broken redware. Srivastava was convinced that this find was from the time of the Buddha himself. For Charles Allen, it's the final piece of the jigsaw puzzle, suggesting that this lower site was the original Sakya burial place and that Buddha's ashes were moved from here to the elaborate new tomb above, just as the inscription said. When Pepe comes along and he finds this huge great box, we're talking about a different era. Somebody has come along and disturbed the original ashes. And then he's added his own particular tribute, his offering of all these wonderful jewels. And we know that that person is almost certainly Ashoka because this great box was Ashokan. The writing, almost certainly added to that inscription, is from the time of Ashoka. I can't tell you how relieved I feel, because when I set out on this journey, I had no idea if we'd come up with real answers, but we have. I'm pretty excited by it, frankly. I can now go back to England and tell Neil Pepe that his grandfather is not a liar, that the inscription is genuine. Not only that, I can say that the jewels that he possesses are indeed genuine. I can hardly believe it. It's a fantastic ending. But Charles Allen has done far more than clear the name of one man. For nearly 400 million Buddhists worldwide, he has confirmed that Piprawa is, in all likelihood, the very place where the Sakyas buried their holy clansmen. and where the Emperor Ashoka later built a magnificent tomb to give honor to the Lord Buddha himself.